is for precinct chairs, vice chairs, elected legislative district officers, Utah County elected officials, and steering committee members. Then on April 26th, uh, I'm sorry, all of the county delegates will go to the county convention. On April 26th, all of the state delegates, which includes the precinct chairs, uh, will go to the state convention. And then um, for the rest of this, it's mostly election deadlines, um, early voting, early um, uh, voter registration, and and there are some central committee meetings on there. And again, pay attention to those if you are a precinct chair or vice chair. Okay, the Constitution and bylaws. And this is my very messy, well-used binder of the Constitution and bylaws. We have a constitution bylaws that govern the way we run our party. This is the rule book. The other part of the rule book is Robert's Rules of Order. So if there's anything that's not specifically covered in here that needs to be covered, then we fall back on Robert's Rules of Order. And I have given you all a little um, cheat sheet for Robert's Rules that you can look over. And that way when you're at the conventions and the central committee meetings where the meetings are run using Robert's Rules, you'll have an idea of how to participate and we'll also do some more training on that at other meetings. We're not going to spend a lot of time on that tonight because we've got lots of other things to do too. Okay, so Lowell Nelson is here. He made it through all the parking and everything. And he's going to talk to you now about the role of the delegate and the roles of the precinct officers. Right. If you have, uh, if you provided your email at your caucus and have not been getting emails from candidates, then uh, that, that's bad because they need your email, they need your address in order to communicate with you. Uh, is, is there somebody here that is not getting email, a ton of email from people? Okay. So it looks as if then perhaps you need to make sure that that data Kristen mentioned gets entered into voter click. Otherwise, those candidates will not have your contact information. Question. Yeah, the question was, what if you don't have email or have problems with email? Can candidates get a hold of you some other way? Yes. They will send you mailers in the U.S. mail, and then you can also meet them face-to-face -face in these meet-to-candidate events or in cottage meetings, or you can call them up on the telephone. Remember, delegates, it is your responsibility to interview and vet those candidates. It's kind of nice when they send you a flood of information, but if you're not getting that information, don't think you can just sit on your couch and avoid the issue. It's your responsibility, our responsibility as delegates, to interview them, to vet those candidates, to ask them questions, and, and so forth. We'll be talking about more about that in just a moment as we talk about the roles, what I call the sacred role of a delegate. But first of all, um, here to talk about the duties of the precinct elected officers. Chairs, um, uh, you're responsible for organizing the party within your precinct. Chairs um, are members of the central committee which means that they attend four meetings per year. So that's eight meetings in the next two year cycle. The quarterly central committee meetings where we discuss uh, bylaw change proposals, we discuss all sorts of party business, how to get out the vote, and, and so forth. Wonderful meetings. Some of you might find them boring, but it is the necessary work of the party. I think it was Sam Adams said, you know, if, if we expect to enjoy the blessings of liberty, then we must, like men, undergo the fatigues of supporting it. So those central committee meetings can be tedious, they can be fatiguing, but they are essential to carry on the work of the party. Also, if you're a vice chair, you must attend, or you are expected to attend those eight meetings. So chair and vice chair, as Kristen mentioned, are members of the central committee. And so you have those eight meetings to look forward to, one per quarter over the next two years. The chair also has the responsibility to fill vacancies in the precinct. If a delegate moves from your precinct or 
uh, or dies, or in some other, uh, for some other reason, cannot participate as a delegate, then you, as the chair, have the responsibility to fill that vacancy. You do so by appointment. Um, you don't need to hold another election. That's it's entirely your prerogative about how you fill or how you identify the person to fill that vacancy. But it is by appointment that you do that. Secretaries uh, and treasurer. You don't have quite as much. Oh, well, a question first. Well, well, you might want to let them know how. Who do they notify when they have to replace someone? Thank you. The question was: uh, We need to, to just mention how you make a replacement, how you fill a vacancy. You, e you email the uh, the county party secretary, Kirby Glad, saying so and so moved from our precinct, and I'm appointing so and so. It's courtesy to carbon copy that so and so, so that that person realizes that you have uh, replaced or filled that vacancy, and then the secretary will reply, acknowledge that uh, that vacancy is filled, so that you know that you are now. Uh, that the vacancy has been filled and that the newly appointed delegate is, in fact, the delegate and will be credentialed at convention. Good question. Okay, treasurers and secretaries, there's not a whole lot laid out in the party governing documents for you to do, but let me suggest something that's vital, I, 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 I believe is vital, that secretaries and everybody in the precinct can help with, officers and committee men and delegates, and that is a review of the Republicans listed on the rolls in your precinct. You might have 1,500 people listed occupying 30 pages. Well, some of those people have, have, um, have passed away. Some of those people have moved from the state. Uh, some of those people live in a different county. And, and so you should review that list. Secretaries especially are good at this. Review the list. Just one by one, and again, it's tedious. And walking through that list, name by name. What does that do? You help to identify uh, those who are not in your precinct anymore, and then you notify the county that they've gone, they've moved, they've died, whatever, and then they can be removed from the registered voter role. By removing them from the role, you increase the percentage of, of, of people who participate in the party. If we're counting um, people who have moved or have passed away in our, in our percentages, then that percentage is a low percentage. One of the great things we do pretty well here in Utah County is that we review that list, and so we, have, we tend to have higher uh, percentage turnouts in our, uh, in our elections. Question, please. How do you know if they've died or moved? Uh, you, you don't know. That's why it's good for the secretary to uh, invite half a dozen others, uh, you know, one from every uh, neighborhood or from every ward or whatever. So you have some knowledgeable people in your circle as you review that list name by name. That's that's how you would know. Please. You, you can also make phone calls and, and ask them, are you still alive? <laughs> Please. <laughs> the list is given to, actually you can get it out of voter click. Just go to voter click and uh, choose to download the list of registered voters in your precinct and boom, it'll be emailed to you. Please. That, that disagrees with what Barbara indicates that he can come with the election board. She's told us when she trains us that never to take that name off the roll until they come in and says that's died, that they will automatically fall off that roll after three times and they have a roll. But I don't have a fight. He's at C. Okay, so she's making the comment about about we can't just kick them off of the roll, and that's true. We are identifying for the county clerk names of people who we believe have passed away or have moved from the state. The county clerk then has the responsibility of uh, I think they sent a series of postcards to that person. If they never get a reply, then they'll remove them from the roll. But yes, the party does not have access to that registered voter roll. That's the purview of the county clerk. But I, I want to be registered as a Republican. Can I help them there? Uh, the question is, if someone wants to be registered as a Republican, you knock on their door, you met them, and so forth, the answer is yes. 
you direct them to a voter registration form and they can fill that, I believe it's online now, you can fill that form out online and become registered. Did that answer your question? That did. Thank you. Thank you. One more and then we've got to go on to the next part, please. Thank you. The comment was, <laughs> okay. The comment is, I have voted 20 years every single cycle, and I went to my precinct caucus and found that I was not on, listed there on the roll. Believe it or not, that is more common than, than you would believe. And it happens a lot, and I don't know why. That's not a party function. The party's not responsible for that happening. But it, it, it happened a ton in the past two or three years, particularly, yeah, I, I'm well aware of that. You know, I don't know of anybody that's really done anything about that yet, but I, it's coming to the point where we do need to do something about it. So after the convention season was over, in the lull of summertime, let's take that up. You contact me or I contact you, let's get together and let's do something about that. On to the role of a delegate, what I like to call the sacred role of a delegate. Why do you suppose we read the platform at our precinct meetings? Some of you might think that's boring. However, let me say, assure you that is the jewel of the party. That is what brings, attracts people to the party. That's what we stand for. If we don't stand for anything, we will attract no one. That platform is our jewel, our crown jewel, and so we read it. Probably once every two years is not often enough, but at least once every two years we get to read it, review it, understand it, talk about it, discuss it, and here's why. Candidates and public officials should be held accountable to the platform. If they are going to be the nominees of the party, they should adhere to the platforms of the party. Right? Else why would we nominate them uh, from the party? So we as delegates need to understand the platform so that we can ask intelligent questions of those candidates and we can judge the public service of our public officials while in office against that platform. It's like a measuring stick. If, if I have a yardstick right here beside me, it comes up about this high. Two yardsticks together would be right about here. And that's a standard. I know that they're about two yards high when they're this high. Well, how do we know if our public elected officials are adhering to the platform if we don't understand the standard, right? That's why I'm suggesting the platform is that important. Our first responsibility as delegates is to read and understand our platform. We have a great platform in Utah County, Republican Party. It's awesome. Let's be really familiar with that. Because the very next duty, in all of, and some of you have already begun to do this, which is great, that is to vet the candidates. And that, this is on your handout, by the way. This is part number two of the two-page uh, stable handout. Vet the candidates. This is where you interview those who are running for public office. You can do it one-on-one, -on, -one, on the telephone. You can do it in a small group setting, like in a cottage meeting. You can do it in these meet the candidates events. I recommend that you spend two to three hours per candidate visiting uh, or, you know, visiting with them, understanding their positions on issues, do it in a variety of settings so that you can tell whether they're saying the same thing to you as well as to other people. And I, I encourage you to ask questions objectively. For instance, if I were um, a raving libertarian, I wouldn't go up and, I, I mean, I could go up and say, well, don't you support, um, you know, don't you want to knock down the NSA and t throw the TSA out of the airports and, and uh, restore our civil liberties? Well, that's a leading question. How do you suppose he's going to answer, right? Or if I were, um, in other words, if you ask the question objectively, how do you feel about civil rights? Or how do you feel about education? How do you feel about um, government? How, 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 what's the proper role of government, right? How do you feel about government intervention and so forth? So if you ask the questions objectively so that the candidates don't know how you feel about the issue, you will get a, a more honest answer. Um, also in here I mentioned a couple of ways that you can score or judge the performance of a public official while in office. 
Uh, we mentioned Utah Grassroots. It's an index published by a group of people, much like yourself. Half a dozen people get together and they grab a basket of bills from the legislative session. And I think it's usually 20 from the House, 20 from the Senate. And then they score the legislators depending on how they voted on those bills. That's a scorecard. The UEA has such a scorecard. Parents yeah, for uh, uh, parents for education. What's it called? Parents, parents for choice for, like, in education. Parents for choice in education has a scorecard. Sutherland Institute, the Utah Taxpayers Association, uh, Planned Parenthood. All of these scorecards are helpful. Even if you don't agree, for instance, with Planned Parenthood, you can still look at their index to see who scores low and who scores high to get an idea of how your legislator votes. Those indices are based on how they vote. And, and so a caution, be careful, take those with a grain of salt. I am not here to tell you that you know the Sutherland Institute index is, is gospel truth or that the Utah grassroots is gospel truth. Those are just a small group of individuals doing their very best to score based on their values. And so you need to take those indices with a grain of salt, realize who's publishing them, and then go gauge that against your own set of values, and most importantly, against the Republican Party platform. Do you have any questions about what we discussed about the sacred role of a delegate? Please. Uh, where can I see a copy of the Republican Party platform? Where is a copy of the platform, he asks, and that is on our website, ucrp.org. UCRP as in Utah County Republican Party dot org. UCRP dot org. Other questions? Thank you. The Constitution and bylaws are there also. It's all the documents. Okay. I want to make sure something is all right for I think Provo Precinct 7 would be basically the BYU housing area. How do I encourage <laughs> Yeah, the question is, I live in a precinct where it's populated mostly by BYU students, very transient. How can I encourage them and get them more involved? He's thinking about a Facebook page, a social media, network all in wonderful great ways I, I absolutely do those things get more people involved especially young people they will be a great benefit to our party thank you and by the way uh, one of the handouts I did not mention it is for duties of the precinct secretary and treasurer I skipped right over that uh, sorry about that great ideas on here question okay so <clears throat> I don't think anybody here is going to agree 100% with the party platform, right? Um, it's possible. It's possible. <laughs> what happens if you find yourself in one or two areas where there's a small conflict with the exact wording of the platform? Should we represent the platform or our personal values? Okay, so I'll let answer this. <laughs> Obviously, well, the question was, if, if, if a delegate has minor disagreements or discrepancies with the platform, uh, you know, that aren't quite entirely reconciled with one's own views, then how should I judge the candidate? That's a very tough question. Uh, we aren't going to police that. There's po no possible way. That's freedom of conscience. As delegates, you, we trust you. We really do. Uh, if I don't go to my precinct, I still trust they'll elect good, rock-solid delegates to go in there. They'll take seriously their responsibility to, to uh, you know, to, to, um, uh, to, to fulfill their role as delegates. So we trust you. Your delegates, you use good common sense. You adhere to the party platform as much as you possibly can. Now, if you have a discrepancy, then you have to decide whether you want to change the platform, which you can do at an upcoming convention. You can. Uh, yeah, submit a proposal to change that part of the platform, change a few words, change a whole sentence, change a whole plan. That's certainly an opportunity. I, 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 I guess I tend to believe that we ought to uh, represent the platform rather than our own views, but 
if that is, is somehow so disconcerting to a person that they can't do that without violating their own freedom of conscience, then you just have to do what you have to do as an individual anyway. I will actually just email electronic copies to everybody. Um, I wanted you to have some in your hands tonight, so if you can look on with a neighbor or something, that helps you to kind of follow along and know what we're talking about and know what you're looking for if you go look at the electronic copies. But I will be emailing those out to everyone. And if you don't receive them, let me know. Okay, the question was, what do we do if we didn't get copies of the handouts? So I will be emailing electronic copies to everyone. Okay, go ahead. Then we got to move on. I saw a handout on the Utah Company uh, for your organization charge. It talks about skirting committees. Uh-huh, we're going to talk about that in just a minute. Well, it talks about how we're supposed to, we may go in as a delegates and actually vote on changes or bylaws. Yep. Well, they send that information to us before we go to that meeting? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you'll be able to have a chance to look over that and, and study it and figure out how you want to vote on it. Okay, I wanted to say before we move on, just one second, okay? For the secretaries, there's one, Lowell went over some of the important things that you can do um, as far as cleaning up the, the precinct roles. There's no reason you can't do that, at least for your own purposes. Those lists can then be turned in. I talked to the county clerk's office today just to verify this. The list can then be turned into the county clerk's office. Keep your own copy. I always say keep your own copy. And if you didn't listen to me at the caucuses, I'm sorry, it's your own fault. No, it might be your precinct chair's fault. You don't have copies of things. You're all precinct chair. Okay. Um, Keep a copy, take it into the county elections office, and they will um, put that in their to-do list to go through and clean those up. He said that it takes a little while to process it and everything, but it is very useful for them to have that information. So that's a very important thing that the secretaries can do. Treasurers who want to be proactive could go out and solicit donations for the party if they wanted to in the precinct. Um, we used to have a program for that, actually, but we got rid of it. Um, but any donations that are made go in the precinct, would go to the treasurer, and then the treasurer would count those and seal them and then take them to the county treasurer, the county party treasurer, right? A um, number of Republicans made pledges during the caucus. So if I were the precinct chair and I got back an envelope saying that so and so and, and, and these two or three other people made pledges, maybe that's something that I could delegate to my treasurer, my precinct treasurer, to go and follow up and collect them, the actual donations, the actual money from those who pledged it. Okay, and one last thing for the secretaries and treasurers both. We have a need for people to do credentialing at um, central committee meetings and also at conventions. And that's something that you would be a great help with. So when the emails come out asking for volunteers to do credentialing, please do, because we need your help. Now there's a question right here. Are there names and phone numbers as delegates given out to survey groups? No, they're given out to candidates. But they're available? They're, they're not supposed to be you. They're not supposed to be given out to survey groups. I got a survey call that started to sound like, I like, I like to cooperate with them, mm. but it started to sound like it was about caucuses, and I said I don't want to talk anymore because I'm a delegate. Okay, so survey groups can't get the registered voter less, mm -hmm. and, if, okay. and that could be... As a delegate, I don't want to talk Right, to right. Um, no. <laughs> no, I don't want to be targeted either. But um, those, the voter lists are available to everyone. I think they're actually online if you'd like to go look, right? Never have. Um, okay, one more question. We've got to move on or we're not going to be out of here by 9 o'clock. Go ahead. What requires a password? What do you get password? The password for voter click. Fairfield. Fairfield. There you go. So for the registered, it's not working? For the registered voter list, that's for the delegate list. What's the registered I, last I don't know. I'm not hearing that question. 
Okay, so they're asking what the password is to get the registered voter list. And before the caucus, there wasn't a password. So, and I haven't tried to download it since then. So I don't know, but if you'll email me your question, I will find out the answer, okay? Okay, so moving along, um, we've covered the duties of officers and delegates briefly, and the calendar and constitution and bylaws are our governing documents. I can pay you a handout, but I'm embarrassed to admit that it's not the one I meant to make. <laughs> so, so anyway, it does give you some very good information, but some of the information I wanted you to have is not there. So I'm going to tell you, and then I will um, scan the other one and send it out with all of the electronic documents. The other one is more what will make you comfortable and what to look forward to and that kind of stuff. And the one I gave you is more the, the official rules. This is what you're supposed to do kind of stuff. Okay, so nominating convention versus organizing convention. This year we have the nominating convention. That's where we nominate candidates who are going to be partisan public officials. On the year of the organizing convention, which will be next year, we elect party leadership. So it'll be the county party vice chair, or the county party chair, vice chair, secretary, and treasurer, and the state central committee members. Um, and then if you're a state delegate, it will be the state party uh, chair, vice chair, secretary, treasurer, is there anything else we elect for there? Okay. Okay, so then the state central committee members come from Utah County. I know there's been a lot of confusion on this in the past. We elect people to represent our county. So it's like a delegation going from our county. And the way we do it now is we do it in Senate districts, right? Is that what we've done? We just changed it last year. So it used to be um, just uh, at large. And now we've narrowed it down to Senate districts. So you will go into a Senate district caucus to elect your state central committee members who will then represent you on the governing body of the state party. All right, um, and those are things that will be done at the county convention. I'm not probably covering my face this whole time, huh? <laughs> Sorry. Okay, um, when you get to the convention, you're going to come a little bit early. Usually there will be uh, candidates there who want you to meet them, and hopefully you've already met them before, but you can get there and you can form final opinions. You can visit with them a little bit more. One more handshake, look them in the eye one more time. And, and decide whether you feel comfortable with these candidates. You also will need to get your credentials, which you probably should do before you go meet the candidates because otherwise the lines are gonna get long and you're gonna get lost. Um, so get your credentials, go and visit with the candidates. There will be booths set up in one of the large gyms and you can go around and visit with all of the candidates that you are responsible for voting for. Then if you have, um, contested races in your house district or a senate district that is totally within the county, you would um, go to those caucuses and then decide who the nominee is from your house or senate district. And a lot of you do have house races. I don't think there are any senate races. Um, so if your house district happens to cross county boundaries, then you won't vote in that. It'll be the state delegates that vote in that, okay? Um, oh, I also tell people to always bring a snack, bring something to eat, some water to drink. It's possible that some of the candidates will bring things for you, but it's also possible that none of them will. So I would make sure that I have food and water and a charged cell phone and uh, maybe some Tylenol. <laughs> That's my favorite accessory to bring. Um, so, House and Senate caucuses, okay, and then Lowell also talked about rules for proposals, and you will get in the mail, and um, you'll get it, well, at the county, do we send them in the mail if there are proposals? Probably refer to them on the website. Yeah, I don't remember ever getting, but if you're a state, state delegate, you will get a call to meeting in the mail, and it will contain all of the proposals, resolutions, um, anything that's being voted on, at the convention will be in there for you to read. On the county level, you'll probably be referred to the website if there are things for you to consider before you get there. Um, office is up for election. I gave everybody a handout. It's called Official Election Notice. 
And it has all of the offices that will be voted on at both the state and county conventions this cycle. So this is this is what we're voting on this time. Um, the county delegates will be voting on county commissioners, assessors, attorneys, court auditors, recorder, sheriff, surveyor, treasurer, and state representatives. State delegates will be voting on congressional candidates, attorney general, state senate, state representative, um, if the district crosses county lines. Okay, and again, your little parliamentary procedure cheat sheet will come in handy if you're at either of these conventions. Let's see if I covered everything. Yes, so now we'll go to the flowchart. Oh, question? Yes, I will email out all of the handouts and more. And you might wish you hadn't asked, <laughs> but I want it. So if you, if you don't have the flow chart, can you get next to somebody who does, or, or if several of you in a row have it, maybe you could share for a minute. Um, and Lowell is going to talk about the structure of the party. And by all means, if you ever get, uh, you know, when you get your emails from Kristen and they have a lot of these attachments, you know, save those attachments. There's a treasure trove of information, a wealth of information in the stuff that Kristen has assembled. I mean, I, she herself wouldn't say it's all of her work, but it's really the work uh, of, of people in previous years who have assembled this information. Kristen's very good at putting it all together. And, and so forth. So, uh, you know, keep a hold of it. It's great information. Make sure you read everything you receive from her. Um, one thing we, uh, we we wanted before I dive into the flow chart, I just want to take three minutes to talk about the allocation of delegates. Some of you uh, may have wondered how it is that your precinct was allocated three delegate seats, or why didn't I get four delegate seats like that other precinct down the hallway? Um, first of all, county delegate seats are allocated one, um, it's, I'm sorry, let me start over. County delegate seats are allocated two per precinct, uh, just right off the top. Two uh, seats per precinct uh, go out to our some 269 precincts, just boom like that. So that's, that's roughly uh, 540 delegate seats um, that are allocated right off the top. Um, and that is, is for the chair and the vice chair because those two seats are bundled with that office, right? If you're elected to be a vice chair, then it comes bundled with that election is a county delegate seat. And if, uh, if you're elected as chair, then it comes bundled with that chair position is the county delegate seat and the state delegate seat, okay? So that's why two are just automatically allocated to every precinct in the county. Then, in addition to those two, there is allocated to every precinct in the county one delegate seat per 500 votes that were cast in a previous gubernatorial election for a contested race for four offices, governor, attorney general, treasurer, and auditor. Okay, so governor, treasurer, or governor attorney general, treasurer, and auditor. If and if those four, I mean, if in, in, in any of those four races which are contested, uh, votes cast for in those four races for the Republican nominee, those are all totaled up. And, and they, they amount, usually in a precinct you'll get uh, maybe a couple thousand votes. If you're a moderately large precinct, you might have 1,500 votes if you're medium size and less than 1,000 votes if you're a small precinct. Does that make sense how that is calculated? Any questions about how county delegates seats are allocated? Remember, it's one per 500 votes. If you are, if you got 499, that's not one seat. And not until you reach that 500th vote do you get the seat, okay? Uh, and, and because the formula is calculated that way, the number of delegates uh, in, invited to the convention has been increasing over the past number of years because our population in the county has been increasing. Back in the 90s, there were fewer than 1,000 county delegates.
Today, or for this upcoming convention, 1,507 delegate seats were allocated. So you see the growth in population results, growth in the number of votes cast for the Republican nominees in those four races, and therefore the growth in the number of delegates in our, to our county convention. Now state delegates. There are 4,000 state delegate seats uh, allocated by the state to the 29 counties. Those 4,000, it's a hard cap, it's a hard number, 4,000. They figured roughly 1,000 per congressional district is a good number, and so that's why we came up, well, that's why the state party came up with the number 4,000. It used to be 3,000 in the 90s, and it went to 3,500 a couple cycles ago, and now it's 4,000 as of the last cycle, after the redistrict, uh, redistricting in the census. Those 4,000 seats are allocated among the 29 counties according to what we call relative Republican strength. And that is based on, again, the number of votes cast for those four races, and if contested races, for the Republican nominee in those four races. Um, and so then uh, you, you look at the number of votes cast by each county, and you look at the relative strength of those, of those counties, and you allocate more delegate seats to the counties who cast more votes for the Republican nominee. That's fair, right? And so Salt Lake County, they get the lion's share. Utah County is the second most populous. We get the next biggest chunk of, of, of state delegate seats. And it turns out we've increased uh, over the number, over the last cycle. We're up to 869, I believe, delegate seats. Those 800, and we'll just call them 800 seats, those 800 seats then are allocated among the precincts in Utah County according to relative Republican strength of those counties after one seat is given automatically to the county for the chair of the precinct. Okay? So one for the chair, and then an additional two or three or four depending on your relative Republican strength as a precinct. Any questions about how delegate seats are allocated in the county or the state? Okay, probably more than you wanted to know. Let's look at the organization chart now. We have um, here at the top, steering committee. That steering committee consists of the four elected officers and the five appointed officers and lies within the circle entitled executive committee. That's sort of a visual attempt to, to, to indicate that the nine members of the steering committee are also in the executive committee. And that lies within the central committee, which is an attempt to show that the executive committee is also part of the central committee. So it's sort of like set theory <laughs> that none of us ever studied, if you have studied in college, set theory. But uh, in fact, I never studied it, so I may, be, I may not know what set theory is. Anyway, one that's like a circle within a circle uh, that's not Avon. <laughs> okay, Central Committee, it describes that, and then from the Central Committee, there are two more circles within the Central Committee, the Constitution and Bylaws Committee and the Audit Committee. That means that those committees are composed of Central Committee members. If you're a member of the Central Committee, meaning you're a chair or a vice chair, you can be elected to the Constitution and Bylaws Committee or to the Audit Committee. And then the duties of those two committees are explained the county delegates uh, uh, are, is a larger circle than that. Um, and then, of course, county Republicans is the largest circle. So this was an attempt, it's, it's a great little chart, um, I think, and it's an attempt to help you understand um, the newcomers to the party, and roughly a third of you are new, brand new, never been in this process before, or maybe most of you, if, if you're good at this training, but if roughly a third of all of the delegates and officers of the party every two years is, is fairly new. Um, so it's an attempt to help you understand how the party is organized. The steering committee has certain responsibilities, op the day-to-day -day operations of the party. The executive committee has sort of like an uh, in between, they, they worry, they meet monthly. Steering committee usually meets every two weeks. The executive committee monthly, and they talk about issues and try to stay current, try to stay on top of things, organize, get out the vote, organize for the convention, and so forth. And then the delegates, we attend a convention every year. If you're a county delegate, you attend a convention this year and next year. Um, and so that's sort of how the party is organized. Question? Any questions? Thank you. Oh, please. What's your role? 
I am a, 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 a training, uh, the not education, the education officer for District 27. So I'm, I'm on her committee. Actually, she has 13 of us to help her. And so it, it was my luck, my good fortune to be able to be here. By the way, you're great. I'm so glad you're here. Many of you are actually smiling back at me when I talk. <laughs> I love that. I, I congratulate you for being here, for being interested, being eager to learn what your duty is and then to go do it. So give yourself a pat on the back. Turn to somebody next to you and give them a fist bump or a high five. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so did you get your question answered? Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, I didn't finish talking about what happens at the convention. You bring your, your photo ID and you are going to get your credentials at the credentials table. Those will be organized according to legislative district, which is your house district. And you'll get in line, get your credentials, then you'll go meet the candidates. You'll go to any caucuses and in your call to meeting it should tell you whether you have a caucus or you don't. If you have any questions, be sure and let us know. Let me go through the whole thing and then I'll then I'll take your questions. Okay, so after the the Senate and House caucuses, then um, we'll go into the main convention, and that's where we address any rules changes, resolutions, any other kinds of proposals, and where we vote on the countywide candidates um, that aren't limited to just your house district. Okay, and then you'll cast your ballots there. And usually we hear from elected officials, um, and we'll probably hear from the county leadership. And you should plan probably on spending at least most of your day at either convention. The county convention should be over by three usually. Is that right? Okay. Start. Um, it depends on whether you have caucuses or not, or whether you want to come and meet the candidates, what time you have to be there. But I would say plan on seven-ish, okay? So you can start psyching yourselves up for that now. <laughs> okay, and for the state convention, I would plan on being there about the same time, maybe a little later because you're not going to have this. No, well, some of you will have Senate or House caucuses, so um, still plan on being there early. Read the instructions that come with your call to meeting and plan on staying there at least until five or six. Sometimes it's a really, really long day, and that's why I say bring Tylenol. Um, you think I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Um, now you don't want to go. It's actually really fun, but when you get to about 5 or 6 in the afternoon, it starts to hurt your head. Um, okay. So now, question, was there a question on conventions? I don't think lots of people know what credentials are. Oh, okay. What are credentials? Credentials are the, the little card that allow you to vote. So you want to make sure that you get your, well, actually, you'll probably have a wristband that allows you to vote. But you'll get a wristband and you'll get a credential card that says which precinct you're in, which legislative district you're in, and if you have a, a party office outside of that precinct, it'll say that also. So you want to make sure that you get your credential that says who you are, get your wristband, because they're going to mark that when you vote. And um, your ballots will also be in this packet that you pick up there. So credentials are a very important step. Thank you for helping me clarify that. There's another question. Hmm. Another question. Go ahead. One real short. Did they pick where yeah. they're going to be yet? For the conventions? You know they have. Where where is where are the conventions? The county convention is at Mountain View, and I think isn't the state Sandy Expo, Southtown Expo. Okay, so the state convention is at the, the Southtown Expo Center. And the other question was, if they make a mistake, like some of the people who talk to the delegates for years and they don't show up on the list, do they just not vote, or is there something that they take care of there? No, there's the, there is the problems table, and if you are a delegate, please come. Don't not come just because you didn't get emails or something. Um, and then if you're not on the list for some reason, and my, I suspect that you are all on the list, I think there have been some glitches with the electronic stuff, and I think maybe some people are sort of out in cyberspace somewhere, but we're trying to fix that. So you, I'm sure you're all on the paper list. So come, 
And if there are any problems, you just go to the problems table and your legislative district chair should know that you're a delegate. So it'll all be straightened out and you'll get a chance to participate. Okay. One reason to go to the convention early is parking, particularly at the state convention at South Hill. <clears throat> okay, she said that parking is a good reason to get there early, and I'll second that. Well, and they are doing electronic voting again this year, aren't they, at the state convention? I don't know. I don't know. Okay, so um, let's move along then to working with the, uh, no, we're going to move on to making effective precincts, how to run effective precincts. And we're going to just go over this really quickly. Um, there are some things that you can do as precinct officers. You can get together and have meetings to, like we already talked about, clean up your voter rolls and find out who's actually a Republican, um, who's actually living where it says they're living, and that kind of thing, so that when you are going around trying to do other things, you know, like if delivering literature or whatever, then you know which houses you need to be hitting. Um, <clears throat> There, you can also have block captains in this effort, so if you divide up your precinct into, you can call them blocks, but usually they're not, they're just chunks, um, and divide them up, get enough people that they can help you to cover your precinct. I've made the mistake in years past of trying to do it all by myself, and my kids get really tired of that. <laughs> So I, I really recommend having section captains or block captains so that you can divide the labor and, and have everybody participate. A lot of times the precinct chairs, um, well, sometimes they don't do anything, but sometimes they try to do it all by themselves. But the reason you have other officers is to help you to make sure your whole precinct gets covered and that everybody's getting the information they need. So make use of the whole committee. Um, you can have discussion groups. We have a high council, not a high council, a city councilman in our city in Highland. There we go, a Highland city councilman um, who has every month at his house, he has a little lunch meeting and he invites speakers to come. And he'll invite, if it's a controversial issue, he'll invite two speakers, one for one side and one for the other. And people come and have lunch and listen to the speakers and they get informed on different issues. They get to hear different viewpoints. And I think if we all did stuff like that in our precincts, um, we, we would have a very educated uh, voting public. And I think that would be a great example to follow. And that's something you can do in your precincts. Um, make sure you have good email lists so that you can get information out to anyone who's interested. Obviously, you don't want to spam people who are not interested. But if anyone is interested, and I'm sure there are lots who are, um, get their emails and keep them up to date on legislative issues, on events that you're having, lunches, meetings, whatever. Just um, kind of try to get the word out and have communication within your precinct. Um, one of the really important things that we do in precincts is getting out the vote. We call it GoTV, and um, on, on election day, there are different precincts that do it different ways. Lowell's precinct had a really great way of doing it, and I think I'll have him write that up, and I'll add it to your list of documents. <laughs> they have a great plan for going to the, to the polls, seeing who's voted, and then calling and getting people to come out and vote. So I'll make sure that's part of your information. Um, okay, so now working with the legislature. All of you as citizens have an obligation to be aware of what's going on in the legislature because it affects you. It affects your children, it affects all of us. So some of the things that you can do to work with the legislature and to help get your opinions out there are send in texts, um, phone calls, emails, and whenever you're communi communicating with legislators, make sure that you are very concise because the legislators are reading tons and tons of material. And some of that will be emails coming in from other constituents, and some of that would be the bills, which we want them to read, right? Before they pass them. <laughs> um, so they've got a lot of reading to do. So if you have a message, put it in the least number of words possible, and make it very clear and very respectful Remember that, that they're there to represent you, but they also are human beings and they want to be treated kindly. So be respectful and brief and clear. Um, 
Okay, so some of the legislators ask you to identify your area so that they know whether you are a constituent. It's not a bad idea to do that, although there are some of us who send things to all the legislators, <laughs> so we might not do that. Yes? On Sunday morning, they, they were interviewing a senator and a representative, and the senator said he gets 150 emails an hour, and the representative <gasps> says during the session he gets 150 a day. Okay, so a senator was talking and said he gets 150 emails an hour during the session. So that's a good reason to make sure that your subject line is clear. Don't just put the bill number. Put the bill number and a brief description and vote yes or vote no. Just right there in the subject line. And then if they want to know your rationale, they can read more. But they might, if they're getting 150 emails an hour or even a day, they might just be looking at subject lines. So make sure that you, whatever information you want to give them is in the subject line. Did I see another hand? Okay. Okay, so um, social media is also great. If you know how to use Twitter or Facebook or any of those things, um, we were talking about using Facebook for, for organizing your precinct, and that's a great idea. Um, but it's also good for the legislators. I know my representative is on Facebook, and so he'll ask questions. What do you guys think about this? And we all answer them. Um, okay, so then if you go up to the Capitol, this is the most powerful way to have your voice heard, is actually going to the Capitol. And they have blue and green notes that you can send in. And Mark, can you tell me which one's which? Mm -mm. No? Well, can you tell me? The House is green. Anybody know? Excuse me, the Senate's green and the House is blue. Senate is green, House is blue. Okay, but it, it's not really that important because if you can find where their chambers are, that's the color they have. So that's why, <laughs> that's why we don't care. We just go right on them. But what you do is you go up to the Capitol and you go to the outside of the, the chambers of the House or the Senate, and there will be, um, what do you call the people who are sitting there? Sergeant of Arms. Sergeant of Arms. Yeah. Pages, pages, whatever. They're, they're sitting at the table right outside there. And you ask if you can send in a note to your legislator. And you write down who you are. You write down what you're there about. And the same thing as an email. Just be very clear in your subject line. Write down the important key points in, in whatever it is, whatever point you want to make. Make sure it's very clear. And then. Um, Send it in. If you want to talk to your legislator, you can say, I'll be waiting outside for when it's convenient for you to come talk to me. But remember that you don't want to pull them away from a vote. So if they don't come out right away, don't be too disappointed because they're there to vote. That's why we want them there. So, um, okay, Lola's going to talk really quickly about, <laughs> about the, the website. Kristen's laughing because she realizes the futility in asking me to speak quickly. Um, the, um, the website, le.utah.gov, le is the first two letters of legislature, .utah is the four characters in the state, utah.gov, G-O-V, first three characters of government, le.utah.gov. It's a fantastic website, you know, I talk to, to people in other states, and they, they curse, you know, sometimes openly, because they don't have uh, many of them don't have the kind of website that we have here in Utah. Some states don't even take recorded votes in their legislature. And it, and it can be one of the biggest frustrations to the, 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 the party, the Republican Party in that state, when they can't hold their elected officials accountable for the votes they take. And so thank our lucky stars that here in Utah, we do have a record of how our legislators vote on every bill. And that's published on the website. So it's a great, great website. First thing I'll mention about the website, le.utah.gov. Utah spelled out? Yes, Utah is spelled out, all four characters. So le.utah.gov. Um, it, it has a list of the members of the House and a list of the members of the Senate. And it has their contact information. And so you know where they live, you know their telephone numbers, many of them list multiple numbers, their home, their work, their cell, uh, some of them have a fax number still. 
Um, and so a great way to, to learn how to contact your legislature. You know you contact them any time of the year. It doesn't have to be just during the legislative session. In fact, some of the most important work they do is during the off-season when they prepare bills uh, for the upcoming legislative se uh, session. Question? Is there a website to see where they get their the question is, is there a website that shows where they get their um, financial support? The answer is yes. The Lieutenant Governor's Office of uh, the State of Utah was also a wonderful website. It wasn't 20, 15 years ago when I first was filing reports for the party. It wasn't quite so good then, but it's pretty great now. Yeah, the Lieutenant Governor's website lists the every candidate who receives not just the public elected, elected officials but every candidate who runs it, it lists that they, they have to list one of the requirements when you run for office you have to list all the money you receive and for donations fifty dollars and greater you have to list the name of the person their address and so forth so yes the answer is yes you can go to that list and find out who received money from whom great question um, okay, so that all the bills that have been filed for each year, um, going back uh, over 10 years, uh, way back before probably 2000, great website. And uh, for every bill, so you can read the bill that was proposed, it has uh, in, in, in the status of the bill showing the votes that were taken on the bills in committee and on the House floor and on the Senate floor, whether the governor signed or vetoed the bill. You know, the pathway of a bill, and if it starts in the House, it goes first to a committee in the House, and they vote it up or down. And if, it, if they've given an up vote, it goes out to the floor of the House to what they call the second reading calendar, and it gets a vote. And then if it passes, it goes to the third reading calendar. If it passes there, it goes to the Senate. They send it to committee. If it gets a favorable recommendation, it comes to the second reading calendar, gets a vote. If it it's an up vote, goes to the third reading calendar, and it gets a final vote. And so you see there's a pathway for the bills. And if bills that start on the Senate side go through a similar process. Now, the, the last week of the session is a dangerous week because they suspend all the rules, and then bills just fly really fast. Really fast. Like the last day, I think they passed a bill, one bill every nine minutes. So it's a very dangerous time. Uh, of the session, but that's you know, life life in the fast lane. Okay, what was I talking about? I was talking about the pathway of a bill. Um, and so you can you can look at the, the website to see what happened to your bill. Not only that, but you can tag a bill, just read out, reach out and touch it, and, and say, I want to be notified any time this bill changes or any time some action occurs on this bill. And you'll get an email notification that HB, you know, whatever, got moved from committee out to the second reading calendar, or passed the reading calendar, and now it's on to the third, or whatever. So those notifications can help you track bills. That didn't work in email this, this kind of, but it did work with um, Twitter and on your iPhone and mobile devices. Your comment was that it did not work in email this time, but it did work on Twitter and the mobile social media devices. Thank you. Is the Lieutenant That's Governor's right. website the same as the other one? The Lieutenant Governor's website is slightly different. I don't have that one memorized, but you just go to U Google Utah uh, Government. It'll be good. Please. There's also a real handy little book that you can get mm -hmm. for those who don't use email all the time. Okay. She's saying there's a handy little book, and she's holding it up in the air, that you can get if you don't have email that <coughs> describes you know, that whole process. One other great service provided by this fantastic website of the state of Utah, the legislative uh, uh, website, is this. It has a, what they call a tracking service. And so you can reach out and just touch the bills you want tracked, and then it, it gives you a web page showing where that bill is along its pathway. Right? So it's, it's passive. You have to go to the website to see what's happening, whereas an email that that get it goes to you as an active, so active versus passive, but there's lots of ways for you to stay informed as a citizen, and I encourage you to take advantage of that marvelous website at le.utah.gov. Thank you. Question? Also, the Constitution and the laws of the state are all listed there, so it's a great resource. Thank you. The comment was, the laws of the state and our state constitution are also listed on that website. Great resource. Please. Also, there's an area where you can sort them by subject, so like 
what I watch is education bills. So I sort by education and I'm able to watch the <clears throat> you guys are great. She's commenting that there's a way to sort the bills so that you can uh, query the, 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 the body of bills and say, I want to get everything on education. And this year you would have seen over 100 bills on education. I want to see everything on gun ownership, everything on uh, rural activity, whatever. So, yeah, it's a great resource. Other, other questions, please, or comments? Question. Where in that path you were talking about do amendments get added? Uh, where on that pathway of a bill do amendments get added? In all three places, in the committee and on the House floor, I mean two places, on the floor as well as in committee in both uh, chambers. So four different places something could be amended. So yeah, you have to watch closely. If you're watching a bill that's controversial, it may very well be amended one or more times during its path to the governor's desk, and you may have supported it early on, and then if it gets amended, you may want to oppose it later. So you have to be pretty watchful. Please. <laughs> and they substitute the bill, so you have to be very careful. There's a substitution that can actually, on the floor, be applied, and it can be, this is what happened last year, it was one way, and then they voted, they received it back from the Senate, a totally different way of substitution, and then when that House went to vote on it. They thought it was the same, and it was not the same. The, the comment was um, that the uh, the legislature can also substitute a bill. So they start out with one bill, and it catches so much flack that the representative or the Senate will substitute a different bill and say, "Okay, you didn't like that one? Try this one." And sometimes it goes to a second substitute. You didn't like that one? Try this one. So yeah, you gotta watch. Okay, we're almost done. Um, I would just like to let you guys know that uh, as far as the caucus is concerned, we have um, SB 54, which is our new um, law that makes us so that we have the caucus system next to a, it's a dual track system. And so people can get enough signatures to get themselves on the Republican ballot without going through our caucus nomination system, um, which I personally do not like. Um, I think that the caucus system is the grassroots system. I think that the, the caucus night is actually a democracy. And from the caucus night, we go into um, a representative government. And I think it's a great system. I wanted to also make sure that you know that there will be lawsuits filed against this bill. So um, keep watching. And if you love the caucus system, please donate to, um, I don't know who to tell you to donate to yet, but the parties, I know the county party is going to be fighting this. So we can use all of the donations we can get, I'm sure. Question. Campaign for that. Uh, that's true. Keep Our Caucus is one of the places there. I gave you uh, flyers. Some of you bought flyers. I'm sure all of you didn't. But um, Keep Our Caucus has a Facebook page and they have a website. So they're also donating to the, co to the um, lawsuit cause. Okay, so now I would just like to open it up for questions. Is there anything that we didn't cover that you wanted to know? Something that we covered that you would like to know more about? At the county convention, how are the votes taken? Are you talking in the main in the main convention? And there will be ballots, and at the nominating convention, our bylaws specify multiple rounds. So it will be multiple round balloting, and I'm not sure exactly what the process will be. I know that we'll have roughly 18 ballot boxes, and um, there will be two people watching each ballot box, and one of them will mark your wristband, and the other will watch you put in a single ballot. And after all the ballots are collected, I'm pretty sure what will happen from there, this is what we've done the last two times, is we'll, cut, we'll have those two people who collected cut the stack of ballots, each of them will count half of the ballots, and then they'll switch and count again. And if their numbers match, then it's good. If they don't match, then they have to recount. Does that answer your question? Okay. Last year, we had some delegates that didn't understand that the ballots were in 
of firefogger and they lost him or they left him on their chair so they walked away. So oh, right. You just told me to say that, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> I need to listen to her. She's like all kinds of good information. Um, she said to make sure that you guard your packets because your packets are your voice. So if you walk away and leave your packet sitting on a chair, it might disappear. It's probably not going to, but it might. So watch it carefully and make sure you protect your voice. As I'm preparing to vet the candidates, I'd like to make sure I have a complete list. Is there a list somewhere that I can download or, uh, of all of the candidates? Who knows where there's a list? Do you know? Yes, if you go to, I can tell you at the county website. Yeah. Is it Utah what? County online? Yes. Yeah, um, Utah County. Yeah. Utah County. What I went to was at co. Utah. Okay, co. Utah spelled out. Mm -hmm. Yes. Dot ut. Dot ut. Dot us. Dot us. And then you go to the clerk auditor. Go to clerk auditor. And then elections. Elections. And county offices. County offices. And there's also a place on there for state offices. And there's also a place for state offices. Awesome. Thank you. There and it's okay. Thanks. Do you have a repeat that one more time? <laughs> <laughs> Just a second. Oh, okay. All right. Do you want to come up here and read it to us? Okay. We'll just have her read it so I don't have to repeat everything she says. Kristen, why don't you send it out in the email? Okay. Okay, we can do that. Okay, it's pretty easy to find too if you just if you just search for Utah County Government. Um, but the address is www.co.utah.ut. Dot us and then um, slash department slash clerk AUD for auditor slash elections slash county offices dot htm that'll give you a link. Thank you. Any other questions? There's one back here. Which offices you need to vote for individually? Um, you should, if you have a contested house race, you probably should know by now that you have a contested house race. So um, other than that, I listed earlier the ones that, um, that we'd be voting on. Okay, at the county convention, it would be uh, county commissioners, assessors, attorneys, court auditor, recorder, sheriff is uncontested, surveyor, treasurer, and state representatives. Is that what you wanted? Or are you wanting actual names? Okay, because the actual names are where. I've had the website she just gave us. Anything else? Uh, the school board will be on the ballot, but because they are nonpartisan, they won't be at our convention. But those are very important. That's something we didn't talk about tonight. School board elections are critical. They're, that's where the decisions are made about, well, some of the decisions, but we're getting away from that now. They're starting to be made by the federal government. But um, if you want to make any kind of a difference at all, you need to make sure you have great school board members. And also, city council is another place that is really important, and that's also nonpartisan. Okay. Okay. Here's a suggestion that um, I've employed in years past. And I suggest that you as delegates uh, might want to do this, and that is simply sit down two or three days before the convention with fellow delegates in your precinct uh, and just talk about all the candidates. I mean, that's a great way to get others' perspective about the candidates. You might see one person one way, and I might see him another, and her perspective might help us both. So it's just a short 20, 40, you know, 45 minute meeting, 
in my own home. I invite all the delegates to come, you know, in my precinct to come. And let's just talk about the candidates very informally. You don't have to do it. I'm just throwing it out there as an idea. Okay, we had one question over here and then there and there. Not unless the vice chair was elected. Okay, the question was, <laughs> I always forget to do that. The question was, does the vice chair have a seat at the camp at the state convention? And the answer is no, unless the vice chair is also elected as a state <coughs> delegate. Okay, over here. Is another great source for vetting the uh, candidates? Some YouTube? YouTube. Some okay. of the candidates that are already in place were involved in um, debate. Oh, okay, so Okay, so she's saying that YouTube is a good place to go to vet candidates because a lot of times there are older debates from the candidates who are running now. Okay, you have a question. Okay. Or comment. Can anybody come to the convention to observe? Yes. Anybody can come to observe, but if there's a question of whether there are enough seats for the delegates, then people who are not delegates will be asked to stand, or you know, if it's a fire hazard, they might not be able to stay. But yeah, anybody can come and observe. Mm, no. No, just because um, you get your wristband checked. Oh, okay, the question says you have the credential to vote. If there's a vote, they'll ask you to raise your credential so that they can see that the people who are voting are actually credentialed. Like if there's a just a group vote, not on the ballot, you'll be asked to raise your credential. And then when you go to the ballot box to vote, they're going to mark your wristband. And if you're not credentialed, you don't have one. So it's, yeah. Well, and at the state convention, they've got, they've done electronic balloting, so you just get your little voter. Right. You would, at the state convention, at last time they had clickers, but those are very very expensive, and I don't know whether they'll be using them this year or not. My personal observation was that nothing was faster because we were using them because it took so much time to explain everything, and I don't, I don't know how much faster it was. Any other questions? Okay, I'm sorry. Where? Um, is there a way to know whether uh, which candidates are going to be up and meet the candidate nights? Um, not really. They all are trying to be, but we have so many meet the candidate nights that I think we're not, we might be killing the candidates. So um, I'm hoping that all of them will be at all of them, but you never know if somebody has a flat tire or a is sick or something they may not be you could try contacting the legislative district chair to see if anybody has said they weren't coming and on, on the calendar it says which legislative district is hosting and if you go on to the county party website it's utgop.org mm -hmm. oh i'm sorry i was giving you the state party ucrp.org right Everybody check me on that. Okay, so if you go on there, you can look under leadership. There's a leadership tab at the top, and then it will have the executive committee. The executive committee is made up of legislative district officers. So if you look on this calendar and it says LD57, and you go on to the county party website, you can look under leadership and the executive committee, or there's another tab that's just the the, the legislative district chairs. Um, but you can find 57 and get a phone number or an email for the person who's hosting there. Okay, any other questions? Yes, Kirby is always looking for volunteers for credentialing, he's saying, and, and I, I would really encourage the secretaries and treasurers to do that because for one thing the delegates should be in listening and not out doing credentials so it's important that we have that help okay one more question and then what we'll do is have anyone with questions just come up and talk to us after go ahead how what address can we email kirby to kirby at kirbyglad.com that's one of them anyway <laughs> he's got a lot uh, .com is what I remember. Yeah. Thank you so 
much for being here. You guys are troopers. I appreciate it. Sorry if you made your time so long. Thank you for coming.